On this episode of TMFF Talks, the challenges of racing the Dakar Rally, the world's toughest motorsport race. My two guests are connected through the film festival, but today the reason they're featured is because they have both experienced this epic race in similar ways as privateers. Individually funded, unsupported racers, a class of competitors who must not only conquer the race with all the same physical and emotional challenges, but also act as primary support for the extensive preparation that precedes the race. Their grit, courage, determination, and humility is nothing short of inspirational. Are you willing to maybe not come back? Because the Dakar is a dangerous race. For me, it's a big philosophical question about how you want to live your life, <laughs> you know, because it is a huge amount of work and it's really not a rational decision to make. I mean, there's far easier things to do than to ride a motorcycle up to 21 days across the desert. Hi everyone, welcome to TMFF Talks. I'm Caius Tenchi, the director of the Toronto Motorcycle Film Festival. The goal of our show is to introduce you to the filmmakers and industry influencers behind the amazing motorcycle movies being produced. For our first ever show, we've got Christophe Barrier-Varjou from Dream Racer and Lawrence Hacking joining us today. Christophe was the main character multi-award winning Dream Racer movie that we showcased at TMFF in 2017. And Lawrence was a judging panel member in our 2018 festival. Welcome both of you and thanks for joining us on this first ever video chat. Thank you. Thank you, Case. Lawrence, you competed in the Dakar Rally in 2001, correct? Yes. Yeah. And at that time you were the first Canadian to finish the Dakar Rally. Yeah. Then you, you wrote a book about it. I think you also attempted it in a car as well. I'm not sure, sure. what year that was. Yeah. And Christoph, you competed in the Dakar twice while it was still in Africa. And then 2006 and 2007 when it was in South America. Incredible. I, I cannot imagine what it would take to get oneself ready, both physically, mentally, financially, everything to, uh, to prepare for that race. I think obviously we saw some of that in your movie Dream Racer. We saw the ups and downs, everything that it took mm. to get there. Lawrence, when you saw the movie, I wanted to know, how did it feel for you? Did it ring close to what your experience was like? Oh, it was very similar. Yeah, I think uh, the movie depicts a, a great effort in, in, a, in a true privateer style as far as um, the difficulties of raising the money, the uncertainty, the preparation, the highs and lows emotionally. Um, yeah, the training, all of that stuff. Yeah, I went through virtually identical experience. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard, especially when you, uh, you know, like Lawrence in Canada, me in Australia, uh, you are far away from, you know, where the race actually, you know, take place. So you have to, first you have to deal with the, the time difference, organizing, you know, your logistics, your bikes and, you know, all the parts and, and everything takes a lot longer um, doing that from, from overseas. So that in itself is a challenge. And if you don't speak, you know, uh, a different language, uh, then it becomes even harder. Um, but, uh, you know, doing it as a privateer, I think that for me, 75% of the effort is, is finding the money to do the race in the first place. Uh, the race is almost the easy part or the easier part. And then uh, the second difficulty is finding the time to, <laughs> to find the time to do the training because you're so busy working trying to find enough money that you don't have enough time to train. And then you are the start of the race wishing you had, you know, 12 months of, you know, 8, 10 hours a day of training. Um, but that's not the case. So you're like, it's like a upward, you know, you, you, it's, it's non-stop, you know, you're still training in the first few days of the race and hoping that uh, you'll make it to the end. So it's not the, the easiest um, and, you know, way to start a, a race like the Dakar Rally as a privateer. Uh, because from the get-go, you are at a disadvantage and, and you have to really look into yourself and say, do I really want to do this thing, you know? Lawrence, I see you nodding your head, so you must yeah, have a similar experience. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's a, it's a, for me, it's a big philosophical question about how you want to live your life, you know, because it is a huge amount of work and it's really not a rational decision to make. I mean, there's far easier things to do than to ride a motorcycle up to 21 days across the desert and 
perhaps it can it can be over every meter of the way. So I mean, in the blink of an eye, you can just throw away all that effort, money, uh, energy, and time. Uh, so you know, there's only a few, there's very few people that really. There's lots of people that want to do it, but there's very few people that actually go and do it. And uh, there's very even fewer people that actually complete their goal and, and finish the Dakar. So I think that uh, it's um, yeah, it's how you want to live your life. And I'm at a stage now where I really think, you know, I've done this a long, long time, uh, 51 years of riding. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's a strange thing. But I got to a point where I started doing the, the International Six Days Enduro, and I, I, I finally realized I did that a few times, and I thought, you know what, this is how I enjoy spending my life. And then I kind of realized that I wasn't battling my own inner demons about making these decisions. I just accepted the fact that I like to do this, and then it went from there. So it is um, – I decided you know, a long time ago that I like to do this, and now I'm at a, an age where you really start to question – whether I should continue on this down this path or not. It's still a great, really good fun time. We just went to the rally in Morocco in October. Yeah. That was just a really, really good time. And now we're making plans for this next year. Yeah, it's 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 always, you know, races like that. I get a lot of people saying, Oh, I want to do the Dakar, but uh, you know, if you sponsor me or if I can find sponsors, and I'm thinking, you really don't want you don't want it good enough or bad enough, you know. If if you really want to do it, you find a way. You you drop your iPhone and you buy an old Nokia. Uh, you sell the good-looking car and you buy a second-hand car. You know, you sell your jeans and you have one pair of jeans and one pair of shorts. How bad do you want it? You know, start with that. And then the second question is: Are you willing to maybe not come back? Because the Dakar is a dangerous race. It's a race of attrition where pretty much half or more than half of the competitors don't finish. And out of those half, you can have a mechanical, you can have a small injuries, or you can have something worse. You can become, you know, paraplegic, quadriplegic, or you, you can even die. So you really have to question your motives for doing the race. It's not an ego race. It's like, you know, like Lawrence mentioned, it is, is your way of life. It's how far am I willing to push my life and what, willing to experience life, you know? Yeah. So if you die, you have no regrets. You know, I've done everything that I could, whether I succeeded or not, I've done everything that I could to live my life to the fullest. And to me, if you have that motivation to start with um, and you're willing to put the sacrifices, I've, I've seen people putting their houses on the mortgage, you know, having 10 credit cards maxed, you know, to the, to the max to be able to do the Dakar. And then five years in a row, they didn't finish. Yeah, sure. Wow. You know, I mean, I'm and they keep going, yeah. On one hand, I understand that the level of determination that's required, that like really clear mindset that absolutely nothing will stand in your way. To your point, you know, put your house to mortgage, uh, max out the credit cards, live off of with one pair of pants only. I, I get it. And that's what it takes. But at the same time, I question like how sane is this? You know, the, one of the hardest questions that people ask me is is why? Why do you want to do the, to do the Dakar or race like the Dakar? And it's like that's not an easy answer to a question to answer. Um, I think I don't think it's it's about the Dakar itself. The Dakar is almost secondary. Uh, the race, you know, the medal and all that. If you do that for that, I think you got the wrong the wrong objectives. I think. Wanting to do the Dakar is because it is the toughest challenge that exists today. And you want to test yourself against that challenge. Not to beat someone else, but to see how far you can discipline yourself, motivate yourself and, and push through all the uh, you know, ups and downs and have, more importantly, the resilience uh, to go through when things go bad. And things will go bad from the time you try to find the money to your broken dreams and injuries and, you know, all sort of things. But wanting to do something like this, I think it's, uh, again, that's, you know, like Lauren said, it's a life philosophy. It's wanting to surpass yourself, your own limits and your own, you know, your own capabilities. And, um, and to me, it's, um, you know, I've lived... Since I decided in 2005 on nearly, nearly uh, very close to my birthday, what should I do? And I'm a bit bored. I started my business. It's working. Um, what is the next challenge? And then I went, oh, why don't I do the Dakar rally? And it was a split decision. It was like I didn't think that, that long. And then I started thinking, 
oh, I promised myself I was going to do it, so now I have to do it. But everything is piling up, you know, how do I find it? I found out how much it costs and I was like, shit, that's, that's a lot of money. Um, how do I go, you know, 10, 12 hours a day without, without eating, without having lunch? That's, you know, unseen, you know. Right. And, um, and the logistic and all that. And then you say, well, look, uh, there's a problem. We break it down and we find a solution. And once you live your life through, you know, having the process of finding solutions to life problem, or in this case, the Dakar problem, which is very parallel to, to life problem. And that's why the film Dream Racer is so successful is because it's chasing your dreams. And it's not about the Dakar. It's about pushing yourself to chase your dream and making it seem, seem you know, see them through is to be able to live your life knowing that whatever challenge stands in your way, it might be difficult, it might be heartbreaking, but there is a way, there is a way out. And you know, even if you fail, that's no failure, you've learned something. And in my view, you never fail, you always learn something. And if you take life as, oh, I fail, I'll never try again, or I fell off the motorbike and that's it, I'm selling everything, or I feel sorry for you because that's not what life is about. Um, and um, to me, it's yeah the, that that self challenge, you know that, and because it's hard, it's even more challenging, and you you want to do it even more, yeah. Right. And can I add to that? <laughs> yeah, please do, Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, it's hard to add to it, but anyways, um, you know, I, for me, I rode, I've ridden motorcycles my whole life, and I really went down this this path, and I never made contacts outside the motorcycle industry business or sport and uh, so i have really not much option and and the dakar is really uh like the pinnacle of what a guy like me would want to do so if you add it all up it's uh it's kind of like climbing mount everest and you know that's what it it's the same kind of challenge you want to do whatever is recognized it's a little bit of a uh, try and satisfy your own ego uh and the the car is so well known and, and worldwide that when people hear that you've finished the Dakar, uh, it's quite a, it really puts all the doubts about who you are as a person to rest. You know, and I, I when I finished it, it was really did kind of cap off a nice career and, uh, and, you know, then you can kind of relax and, 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 uh, and know that, you know, the path that I chose has a kind of a, a, a really nice, finish to it, I guess. Um, not that it, that's where it stopped because I kept keep going and it actually opened up many, many other doors and it really changed the, my career path or my life's path because it opened up so many doors and, and really changed my whole life. Um, but I think that one of the things you have to realize with the Dakar is you have to be ready to put yourself out for the world to see who you are as a person under really, really tough conditions. And you can't be afraid of that. Also, you're going to find out for yourself who you are as a person, how you how you sustain uh, incredible fatigue, danger, uh, stress, pressure, um, you know, uncertainty, dealing with problems. It's, it's really a metaphor for life because uh, it really compresses nearly every problem you'll experience in a normal lifetime into a whole year. And then it unfolds in front of you in 21 days or whatever, however long it is. And you have to be ready to put exactly who you are as a person. There's no hiding behind any excuses or anything because everybody's watching. Like I'm not, when my, if you, I don't know if you had a chance to read what I wrote in my book, but my Dakar nearly finished me a few times where I thought this is it. I've, I've thrown this away. Uh, mm -hmm. it, fi it nearly finished a few times, but it actually came back to me. <laughs> so it was really unusual. Um, never, you know, give like, never, never give up. Pardon? Never give up. Never give up. Always find and then that's exactly what life is, like Christoph says. So that's an it's an opportunity. A Dakar is an opportunity to really, sh if you're not afraid of it, to showcase who you are as a person right. to the rest of the world. And right. in my world, which is motorcycling, that's what it was. Right. Uh, back to you, Christoph. You had mentioned Dream Racer. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Here you are trying to get funding, trying to pull everything together to participate in the Dakar rally. And if that's not difficult enough, for some reason you decided that you wanted to film this. Where did that idea come from? Did you not have enough things on your plate? Was everything too simple and easy that you wanted to make it more complicated? 
I mean, before you even go there, let me just remind everyone that Dream Racer won two awards at TMFF. And that's nothing because I think it's won at least 10 awards worldwide. It is the uh, most, the winningest motorcycle movie of all time. Wow. It is the only movie about the Dakar Rally that's won an award. That's right. Yeah. How did the idea of making this movie come about and why add this extra layer of complexity? Well, the, the, the first idea came in back in 2005 and I said, look, I was in Australia, there was very little coverage uh, of the Dakar Rally. And um, I thought, well, if we had a camera crew following the Australian efforts, maybe we will get uh, sponsors interested in, in filming this. Um, so I contacted a, a couple of Australian competitors and, you know, um, didn't really, um, you know, take off. The following year in 2007, I, um, I had a chat with the film crew, uh, production film crew and proper, proper cameras and all that. And when they told me the cost of making a film like the Dakar across two weeks, I was like, whoa, this is never going to happen. This is way, way, you know, above, you know, my budget. Uh, but, you know, one thing is that, you know, when, when you are in that frame of mind and you are competitors, you hate unfinished business. And, and there's always this thing, like, if you want to do something, you have to find a way to make it happen. And, um, and so the, the idea was still in the back of my mind and I had to find a way to, to do this. And I was not going to do the Dakar on the motorbike forever. So when I was running out of money and it was like the financial crisis in 2008 and there's mm -hmm. no money anywhere. And, and I said, well, you know, to, <laughs> to add insult to injury, I need to find a way cheaper and uh, to, to, to make a film because I'm not sure if I'm going to do it again. So because I didn't have enough money, you know, the, the options of having a mechanic and assistance, you know, pretty much, you know, went down. I said, well, might as well take that as a challenge and do the true Dakar spirit, uh, running my own, you know, maintenance and everything every day. Uh, so I look forward to that challenge and I say, well, this is my last chance of, of finding someone to, to make the film. And uh, the closest I could find was someone that was making commercials, 30 seconds commercial, through a friend of mine. And as you saw in the movie, we met, you know, helping a friend uh, move house. And, and to me, if you know how to make 30 seconds, put them together, we got a 90 <laughs> minutes film. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, obviously that was, uh, that was a challenge in itself. You have two guys here that want to do the Dakar rally. In Australia, the Dakar is not very well known. It's not something that is uh, very well, you know, shown on television and, and trying to find someone to support your sponsors and, you know, pre-sale and all that. It was, it was a lot of waste of time. Nothing, nothing really happened. So we really scraped the, the barrel, Simon and I, to, to find enough money to, uh, you know, pay for his entry fees and, and also the, the rights, uh, which cost a fortune um, to get the images from the Dakar Rally. Right. And that's one of imagine. the reasons why, that's one of the reasons why not a lot more people do films about the Dakar Rally because, you know, it's per the minute, it's a fortune. And, um, and then negotiating those rights worldwide took a long time so uh, but ultimately i wanted to make a film to show you know what it takes to do an event like the dakar rally to really show the the other side of the story not not you know the fancy side and the factory riders and you know and, and you wonder you know uh, you don't see the hard part you don't see the real dakar rally um and i wanted to show the film i wanted this film not to be about Simon and myself, I want it to be a film about inspiring other people to chase their own dreams. And, and Simon did a fantastic uh, job at putting this story together. Yeah, I mean, it, uh, it was really well told and it touched uh, people's heartstrings. And um, there was lots of highs and lots of lows and uh, overall an amazing movie end to end for sure. And you've since then taken that movie and you've launched something called Dream Racer TV that um, provides other inspirational type of movies like that as well, right? That's right. So uh, my Dakar really hasn't finished. It's taking a different form. You know, like Lauren said, you know, once you do this, it, your, your life takes a different uh, meaning and, and different, you know, different trajectory. And because we... We're two guys. There was no, you know, 
um, Angelina Jolie or, or Tom Cruise or whatever in there. Uh, so it was really, really difficult. It's lessons learned for next time, but uh, it was really <laughs> difficult to promote the film and to sell the film because two unknowns, high risk. Uh, nobody wants to know. First film ever. Uh, who is going to put money on the table to, you know, to finance this? No one. We had to do everything ourselves produce the film, promote the film, distribute the film, contact the television channels, contact the airlines, make a DVD, put a website together. And, and, um, and, and that in itself is, is a Dakar 10 times over. Um, you know, in, a, in, a, in the industry as difficult and as competitive as the entertainment industry, trying to sell a film about two blocks that nobody knows, um, is a tough gig. Mm -hmm. And so this this teaches you so much though. Now I know everything about online advertising. I know all about SEO. I know all about Google AdWords. I know all about Facebook and, you know, and um, and, and that opened, you know, obviously uh, other doors. Um, and one of them was to, to develop a um, uh, on-demand video platform. There's a Netflix of the world, there's the iTunes of the world and all that. But if you put your mo movie on that, there's absolutely zero money for you. So it was not even an option. And so we, I put together this uh, on-demand platform called Dream Racer TV. And the goal is to show documentary films, true story um, about ordinary people doing extraordinary things to inspire other people to do the same thing in life. And Dream Racer TV now has audiences from 82, 82 or 83 countries already in the space of 12, 18 months. Wow. And, and the stories are, are pure stories. It's not all, all about, you know, special effects and drone photography and 4Ds and 5Ds and what might not. It's about the story. And when you read a story like Michael Groom, that is one of the handful people to have climbed the five tallest summits without oxygen on the up and on the downside as well. And on his second attempt, he lost all of his toes due to, due to frostbite. Spend wow. another year to relearn how to walk and then climb the other three tallest summits without oxygen, without toes. You know, how inspiring is this? You know, uh, when you have a story like uh, Luke Tiburski, his uh, self imposed ultra, ultra marathon, 2000 kilometers, he decided to swim from Africa to Europe, um, run across the coast of Spain, wow. and cycle across France. And in the space of uh, 12 days, 2,000 kilometers every day. You're talking about 80, 100 kilometers run every day or two, 300 kilometers bicycle every Inc day. Self-imposed, no right cameras, right. nothing, just himself. And those are the stories that we want to show because to me, it's uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have the same, you know, here's Sylvester Stallone, here's Angelina Jolie, but those are the real, those are the real people. Yeah, it's not, it's not faking. It's not, it's not a fake story. It's a real deal. Yeah. I love how s stories like that really like push your own internal, at least my my own internal limits of what is humanly, physically possible. I think we're nowhere near that limit. And obviously there's so many people out there that are just pushing that limit further and further. So it's, it's absolutely incredible and it, it's inspiring for sure. And to me, the, the, the number one, you know, um, tick for me is that no one is asking those people to do that. There's no, it's not sponsored by Red Bull or Monster right. or whatever. Right. It's Good them. Point. It's them. They have an issue. They dealt with depression or they dealt with broken dreams before. And they say, no, my life is not over yet. I'm going to beat myself. And it's just incredible what they come through, you know, with self-imposed challenge. Right. Um, unbelievable. Like our local guy, Oliver Solero, he broken tooth. Yes. Do you know him? He's a. Have you seen the hit? What he does? He does. A, he rides in the winter. <laughs> he rode a. Was it a snow bike that he took dog food up to uh, Churchill, Manitoba in the winter last year? Documented. It's unbelievable what he's seen. <laughs> like crazy, yeah, yeah, yeah. old and hardship. So that's cold. right. There are so many stories like this. Unfortunately, many of those don't make into a documentary or a film. But there's a lot of people doing this you know if you look at the uh, the story of nicola uh, duto the italian that participated in the dakar a paraplegic first time a paraplegic completed the dakar correct completed or finished oh, no he didn't complete it he got excluded okay well let's not go into that because it's a bit controversial but uh 
just the fact that he was willing to take part in, in that race mm -hmm. without the use of your legs. I mean, that's not easy. This riding engines, as you know, Lawrence, is, is, is even with two legs and two arms, and it's freaking hard work. I but believe having that just the up. <laughs> It's just incredible, you know, the the amount of uh, of hope that this guy has given to you know many injured riders around the world. To me, the Dakar organization would have, should have said, "Look, yeah, it's, it's okay. okay if you miss so many waypoints. Yeah. Please continue." Yeah, that would have been a. Oh, I get goosebumps just talking yeah, about it. It's, it's just, just the, same with <laughs> the, the other fellow, the French guy who finished in the car, Philippe Croison. Do you know him? Yes. Yeah. No arms, no, no legs. No legs. <laughs> what? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. And you listen to this guy and you feel sorry for yourself because he's, yeah. he's full of energy. He's got so much energy, so much inspiration to give. Yeah. And very often you find that people that have lost, you know, sure. limbs or that have gone through a major trauma in life end up being the happiest. And the reason why they start appreciating what they have as opposed to what they don't have. Mm. Yeah, that's important. And it's, it, yeah, it's so unbelievable. Yeah. Unbelievable. On the mention of cars, I'm going to jump a little bit. Oh, uh, cool. Lawrence, you're prepping a car for. Yeah. <laughs> Christoph is hiding himself here. Lawrence, you're prepping a car yeah. for another attempt? My car isn't the best choice for, say, a current Dakar. It's a. It's not the best. It would be really. I'm going to try and go to the rally in Morocco, which is in it with it, which is it's more suited for that type of rally. But that's a springboard to try and get a car drive, right? In the Dakar, I, that's my. That would be. Well, I can rest after I finish in a car. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, you you said before though, Lawrence, that when you finished the Dakar, that was sort of a nice you know, yeah. cap to your <laughs> career. And I was already thinking at that point, what, what are you talking about? Oh, like, what, what, it, what it didn't mention is the famous sentence, with age comes the cage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that, that thing, I've been working on it for a long time. And, um, you know, it's about time I actually put it to good use. I, I had it, I just have not enough money. So I, I, I'm not the kind of guy to raise a whole bunch of money. I'm better off working on cars. But if you really want to finish in a car, you have to, it's baby steps. So you have to raise enough money to, to, ha to rent a good ride. That's the most efficient use of time, I think, anyways. I'm not, to, to build a car yourself in your own garage, which I'm doing just behind me here, is not the best way to go and do it. It's an admirable way to try, <laughs> I think, but it's not the most efficient way of actually realizing your goal of getting to the finish line it's better to raise a quarter million dollars and pay uh, an experienced team to put you in a car so you fly in with your helmet and your driving suit have a camper there and you just do it so but as i said when i finished the dakar it actually opened up a lot of doors and i know a lot of people who can help realize that goal now and if i what, what i've always said is that people aren't going to call you you know i'm i'm not going to get calls while i'm sitting on the couch watching the dakar on tv you got to be out there putting yourself out as being the guy that does this kind of thing and then keep doing it right. and then making enough contacts to the point where, yeah, you know what, you can raise enough money to do a good job. That's possible. I think that's the most realistic way. I can get to the start line like I did before by putting it all on my credit card and just paying it off recently. <laughs> With all, it was also the, the, the way the plan was is to become the guy that, you can generate enough support to do it correctly the next time. So if I go to the, the rally in Morocco, which is quite feasible um, with this and finish it and maybe, maybe, maybe um, get our 24, 24 year old good looking daughter to drive it and I'll navigate, that might be good marketing too. <laughs> might do, geez, that might be a good ploy. But anyways, it's always strategizing, trying to figure out what, how to get, how to get things done. And that's, that's what I can, that's the only thing I'm, I'm out of ideas after that, you know. Well, what about you, Christoph? You've got wheels in motion. When I finished the, the, the Dakar in 2007 in Africa, I saw this single seater buggy in, uh, in Senegal uh, from Philippe, Philippe Gash. And I said, oh, this is me. I can see myself in this. 
and since then I've been wanting to you know uh, move from Dubai to the buggy side of things and uh, the way I want to do it I want to do it similar to Dream Racer um, that guy self-funded pushing all the limits starting the car building the car and um, uh, not myself but having people to build the car and uh, and race without any co-pilot in the Dakar rally mm -hmm. now I've got close to being able to do that uh, a couple times unfortunately things have, have fallen uh, through so one of the cars has been built um, but it's not good enough for, for the Dakar so things that you learn along the way uh, the second car um, powered by a 7 liter Corvette engine which I bought, the, I bought the motor I've got the chassis and uh, down the track I found out that the chassis was not wide enough uh, to have enough fuel for the 800 plus kilometers uh, and that, that the Dakar rally requires so back to square one again so I've got about a car and a half one is not good enough the other one doesn't get me you know to have the race <laughs> Uh, so back to square one again in, in building another chassis and, and trying to finish that thing. But as you say, you know, racing on a motorbike is, is expensive, but in the car is, is prohibitively expensive. And uh, I've been going at it since uh, 2007, 2008. And uh, it's, uh, it's very thin, you know, the wallet is really, really skinny. So it's, um, and it takes a long time and everything is expensive the wheels the suspension the engine the gearbox the gearbox is freaking nightmare which chassis is that car you the one you it's, have it's uh hand built it's uh, built from scratch yeah so and the engine uh, which is the seven so, liter so the one that is not the car that is not finished today is the LS7. Oh, the that's Covert motor, yeah. It's a big, big engine. And the reason why we went the, to the big displacement is to uh, to counteract the effect of the, the air intake restrictor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we keep the torque. We lose the power, but we keep the torque. And to have something somewhat reliable with lots of torque, yeah. It's a transaxle? Uh, it will be an Albin six gear uh, sequential. So that's an Australian transmission, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. So I'll, and the goal is to have a car that doesn't require, you know, a new transmission halfway through. Because just to let you know, uh, Carius, the transmission is anywhere between twenty-eight and thirty-two thousand dollars. Yeah. I and know. so just just take two. You you change it? Sure, I change it halfway through. <laughs> So, Twenty-eight to thirty thousand dollars for a transmission, and you need maybe two. That's right. So. Got it. You know, with the new side-by-side -side okay. class, that's quite interesting. You know, Robbie Gordon, we followed him quite closely. They they finished three of those cars. The price to rent that car was one hundred and seventy-five US, and you get to keep the car at the end of it all. No, oh, you get to keep the car. Okay. Yeah, you get all three of them. We checked. We were. I was trying to get a friend of mine to. Uh, I, I would be a co-driver. And I was yeah. trying to get a friend of mine who's in, based in Phoenix. He's got some interest in going, but um, uh, so we we were gonna. We know we have contact with Cole Craig Potts, Cole Potts's father, who they Cole Potts is one of the guys who had that ride, one of those rides. But they finished all three cars. They got them to the end, which is quite good. And they're amazing. Arctic, Arctic Cat based transmissions, you know, engine transmission. But Robbie does a complete roll cage, you know, a complete chassis and different classes so they were i think they were in the open score open class not the side-by-side -side class but Casey yeah, i think that's because of the um yeah the uh, also they were four-wheel drive as well uh yeah I, I believe so that put them into the car category yeah yeah four-wheel drive wider and taller tires and stuff than the side-by-side -side. but they were essentially side-by-side -side. so there's an option there that's pretty reasonable of 175 us to you know show up and drive and pretty good uh, check. Especially if you get to keep the car, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. The cars aren't super valuable. Like, you know, I guess it would be about 80,000 to build one. I, I don't know. I know guys who have about 80,000 US in a Can Am, you know, rally type car. But um, yeah, like you say, the first thing I did is check how far you have to go in a tank of fuel and reverse engineer your car from there. You know, that's the first step. So how far do you have to go in fuel? And then uh you know start so i think that my car is better because the engine i have in it now the fuel i've got on it should be able to finish the rally in morocco 
reasonably easily. And I don't have the restrictor in it yet, but I think I can talk to them and say, look, I just let me run the car and, you know, try and finish it. And then, you know, put me, there is a score open class there too, that hopefully is less restrictive than the FIA especially, right? So less restrictive than, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. this doesn't have a lot of power. I wouldn't be in contention to win or anything. I just try and win a class. I just try and finish. But it's interesting uh, to think about all that stuff for sure. Yeah, yeah, it might be. And Carius, Carius, when we talk about fuel range for the Dakar, just to give you an idea, uh, for a, a big V8 engine, you need at least 100 to 120 gallons of fuel in the car. So that's what 400 or so liters or so um, of fuel. Yeah. Right behind your back. That's quite a lot of fuel. I can't imagine that. Yeah. Wow. So, so it's uh, so an average car would take, let's say, 50 liters yeah. and you're talking about nearly 10 times that the fuel load and the difference between an empty and so a recipe for a big poof. <laughs> no you don't want that yeah <laughs> no absolutely not one of the biggest problems is the weight because the difference between empty and full is so great that this, yeah. the suspension settings are always a compromise <laughs> so you have really have to, even on motorcycles it's the same but uh, it's always a compromise to figure all that out but it's fun to work on it. And is it like, are you really tied down to where that fuel cell can be? Like, like the position of it, for example, because I can't even, I'm thinking like that could just act like a big, you know, momentum arm, depending on where it's placed and really, really throw off the way that your car handles. Look, we went through this whole exercise and it took me six months to get the right answer from the, uh, the FIA in terms of positioning of the fuel cell. Uh, basically, the rule says you can have as many fuel cells as you want as long as it is within the structure of the vehicle. Yeah. The sub, 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 sub rule says that uh, it has to be within the wheel displacement. So mm -hmm. you cannot go past the wheel displacement. So for example, if you wanted a, a fuel cell, uh, most of the fuel cells are, are part of it is under your seat and on your back. I mean, that's pretty much the only spot to, to put it up. Or if you have a front engine, you can put the fuel cell, uh, you know, the bigger fuel cell as the back, like the NASA Latia right. uh, uh, Toyota. But when we were running out of space for our fuel cell, because we could only put about 90, 90 or so gallon, which was just, a little bit too short uh, we thought well the other option is to put it on top of the gearbox at the back is still protected but that would have been extended past the center of the rear wheels oh. and then we found out that this was not allowed so the other option and the only spot the only space was above having about 100 liters of fuel just above the engine and that that's not possible for me because that's too risky right. um, and uh, so you're stuck with, you know, a car that is too short. So, you know, putting that amount of fuel, um, it's, it's really, really problematic because ASO wants you to be able to go 800 kilometers plus or minus 10% in distance uh, with the fuel. So that's, that's a challenge. And races like in Morocco or race in Brazil or those other races, they only require about 600 kilometers, which makes things in life a little bit simpler. But then if you build a car for that, you cannot use the, the car for the other one. So it's... Um, it has to be very purpose-built. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, you mentioned Brazil. Um, when I was doing some research prepping for, for this call, I came across this, this story that you had mentioned in, in an article that had to do with like a cheese sandwich mm. at a gas station yep, in Brazil. Yep, I still remember that. <laughs> Can you... Tell our audience a little bit about that. Sure, sure. Let me go back a few things. You know, my first Dakar didn't end up very good. You know, it only lasted, you know, three days and I had two massive crashes. First crash, I, I broke my nose. I hurt my kidney, dislocated my shoulder. Then I remember the movie with Mel Gibson when it goes like that. So I did that and about 20 minutes later, the shoulder <laughs> went back in, kept going. Oh. Refuel, the bike went from being totally empty to full. Heavy, no strength on my arm, pain in my back, couldn't breathe with my nose, my knee was blown up, fell again, broke three ribs, someone helped me to get back on the bike, finished the day, and then the next morning I couldn't get out of the tent because everything was stiff. 
So first dream broken. Second dream about 12 weeks later, or no, eight, eight or 10 weeks later, I went to race in, in Argentina, uh, which ASO bought the organization to do the race, you know, in Argentina later on. It was called the Patagonia Atacama Rally. And eight, I can't remember if it was eight days, six days or eight days into the race, I broke one of the rib again because it was not properly thing. So that, that dream got crushed again. And then stop on again, I said, no, no, I need to finish a, a rally race because, you know, this, uh, I'm not going to waste all this money and not finish the race. And then I signed up for this race in Brazil, uh, a 10 day, uh, 10 day rally, except that on the second day, I stopped at the petrol station and I was a bit hungry and I bought this uh, piece of bread with some cheese on it and I got food poisoning <laughs> and this is not a happy place to be. You race. <laughs> boiling hot you know so hot in the desert and luckily for me it was coming out from the you know from the top and not from the bottom and vomiting every half an hour i could not eat or drink for four days i lost eight kilos in those four days my legs were like spaghetti overcooked no strength whatsoever and and the, the amount of effort that i went through to finish this race was humongous compared to all the Dakars put together. Uh, it was so difficult. I started swallowing my own tongue. I had to get stopped and get fluid into my vein to, so I wouldn't swallow my tongue. It's a weird feeling. The tongue slowly gets in and there's no way you can, there's nothing you can do to stop it. Com and that's caused by dehydration? Dehydration, yeah. Dehydration. Wow. You're so far into the dehydration that you start using whatever fluid is around your body and your body wants to you know keep everything you know for itself and it was hard wow. and after four days i finally came out of the food poisoning stage uh, i still have the helmet here like i vomited in that helmet so many times everything a little bit of water bleh, you know a little bit of food bleh, you know nothing stayed in and the amount of memories good memories that came with that those difficulties stopping in villages where people will send the kids into the forest get some oranges cut them for me try to feed me and then that will give me some energy for another half an hour 40 minutes and then my whole body will drop again to i remember stopping in a small village putting the bike on the on the wall and and an old lady all dressed in black was sitting you know on those chairs watching the people go by and she looked at me and said do you want to go inside and, and in the shade and I said, yeah so and i walked in and um very religious people like you know crosses everywhere and then she directed me to you know this her granddaughter's bedroom and i'm thinking uh, i'm sick you know <laughs> <This> is, <laughs> i'm really sick and i lay down on her bed and then a granddaughter came in a 16 year old girl beautiful girl with a two-year-old baby and you start thinking, well, those people, you know, go through life a little bit, you know, they have different way of, ways of life. And, and what she's struggling with, she's 16, she's got two-year-old. She's still got posters of, you know, what young girls have, posters of singers and famous actors on the wall and everything. And she's drawing pictures to ask me, you know, what I want to eat. How beautiful is this, you know, just willing to, you know, give you a helping hand and few days later we stopped two o'clock in the morning i spent 21 hour riding with vomiting every half an hour through the night no light using the moon to make my way through and then uh, uh, we arrived in a small village and we knocked on doors and this old man opened the two o'clock in the morning opened his home to us and you know shared one of the bedrooms that they had with us so we could sleep the night I mean, if you, if you knock on doors here in Australia or even in the US or Canada, you know, they call the police on you. And this guy just say, hey, come in. And then a few minutes later, his wife wakes up and comes down and asks me if I want to wear, you know, new underwear. And she's showing her husband, 75-year-old <laughs> husband, massive underwear with a big side <laughs> pocket on the side. And they say, oh, that's okay. That's okay. I can't even wear what I've got again, you know. And in the morning, they made us a big breakfast, invited everyone. They had the people from the rally. They were very happy. I mean, those are through Amazing. the hardship and the, the difficulties of food poisoning. You made, you know, lifetime memories. And to me, you know, like Lawrence said at the beginning, you know, you go through the Dakar and you experience life. 
you experience, you know, you have a lifetime experience, two, three lifetime experience every day of things that you see or things that you experience. And, and no money can buy that. I mean, it's, it's people spend their time watching Netflix, dreaming. Just go out there and do something, you know? Right. Life is too short and it gets shorter when you get to the end of it. You know, you look back and say, oh, that yeah. was a bit of time wasted. And, and right. to me, it's just like you, you get so emotional. And then the following year, uh, two years later, I went back racing there. And um, as a thank you, I bought a bunch of bicycles. Um, and we, with a charity, we gave bicycles away to each of the, the, the school village that we crossed for the kids' physical education and teaching them how to fix bikes. Oh, that's bikes amazing. And yeah. So that's it, was, amazing. Uh, it was beautiful, yeah. I love Brazil. It's such a beautiful place, yeah. Incredible story. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Do you, I think, um, do you think it'll go to, um, um, back to Africa now? Well, uh, I ran, a, I ran two polls, one on Instagram and, and our Facebook page, which got 28,000 people and 61 and 62% of the, the people said they would like to see the race back in, in Southern Africa. So yeah. uh, North West Africa, it's kind of the, the door is shut because of the Africa race. Uh, so I, I really doubt that there's going to be two concurrent race through Mauritania. That will be a bit dumb. Yeah. Uh, so the only way for for the Dakar is either to stay up toward Algeria, Tunisia yeah. and all that or go down to Southern Africa which has beautiful deserts through Namibia and all those places. Yeah. Uh, staying in South America unless they can open up the doors of, of Brazil and Ecuador and all those places. Yeah. Uh, having another race in Chile, Argentina and everything is... Uh, on yeah. the competitor side I know they are not that keen on, on going there, you know. Well, I did read uh, a French article that said that uh, Etienne Lavigne did have meetings in, in Algeria, and the other options were Namibia, South Africa, which has, you know, South Africa has a strong off-road racing community. Mm. Terrain is good, and maybe there's interest there. The, the, only, uh, the only challenge is uh, now they've been used to getting paid by governments to host yeah. the, the races in, in Africa. That's not going to happen. So... Uh, they have to do what's right for the spirit of the race versus what's commercially, you know, yeah. viable. So they they did pull the, the Peru race off. Like uh, there was the the right some of the riders were quite complimentary of the race, even though it was kind of like pretty confined area for the Dakar, but it was a good race. Um, so I don't know if yeah they they've kind of exhausted all those countries as far as payment goes and. If you put yourself in those, the country's shoes, I mean, they've got their exposure that they wanted, those beautiful landscape scenes, and they've proven that they're able to host the world in, in that types of event, and that should translate into tourism dollars or something. But it seems like, uh, I think there's a lot of people, well, they were, the entries were down this year, I think, as well, in the card. Yeah, the entry was down. The local racer were, you know, on the way up. Uh, yeah. The old school guys, they are nowhere to be seen apart from the factory, you know, paid riders. Yeah. Uh, you know, you look at all those racers, that's where the, the face of the Dakar, you know, back in Africa. And they, you know, they, they did once or twice in South America and, and that's it, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's interesting. People ask you, you know, what is harder, South America or Africa? And that's, that's an interesting question to answer because in South America, the difficulty comes from the temperature, the high altitude, the freezing cold weather. Yeah. Uh, the terrain, dirt is dirt, so you always have difficulty with sand and all that. Uh, in Africa, the difficulty came from knowing that if you crash hard, the first closest hospital was in Europe. Yeah, exactly. The closest good hospital. In South America, it's just 40 minutes away. Chile is 600 kilometers as the widest part. Yeah. You know, you've got good hospital there. So the, the fear factor of racing in Africa, when you arrive at the bivouac and it's just dirt and yeah. nothing. I know that, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, even cleaning your, 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 your bike or cars or, or fixing everything is, is a challenge in itself. That's, that's difficult. In South America, you're on the parking lot most of the time. And, you know... You hardly see the races any, anymore because they all go into camper van, air conditioned camper van. And in Africa, we had to sleep in tents and you know, uh, yeah, and those sort of things. So, what is the most difficult, the, the terrain or the fact that you know, the fear factor of going? And you know that when you are in the desert in Mauritania, 
800 kilometers around you, there's nothing. You might see a camel, yeah, exactly. and that's it. In South America, you stop. I swear to you, you stop anywhere. You wait five minutes, you've got your choice of Coca-Cola or Fanta. Yeah. You know, it's always it's someone popping out of somewhere. And I've uh, heard a lot of those stories too. Yeah, of, uh, the top drivers knocking on the, uh, you know, they're staying in luxury hotels every night, and they get a little knock on the door, and someone hands them a nice coffee, and then they say, "Okay, we'll drive you to the bivouac." Like you say in Africa, it was <laughs> just there was nothing there. If there wasn't a few ragged tents. There was I know. I, I remember in Mauritania, there was like this young girl that came up to me and said, "Do you want me to to wash your clothes?" It was at the rest day. Yeah. And uh, my mechanic Max saw me say, "Yeah, sure, take it and bring it back." He looked at me like, "She's gonna steal it." I said, "No." No. Because she's gonna make the money. She doesn't have any use for those clothes. And sure enough, three hours later, the clothes came back all clean and that was my only racing pants and racing shirts. But you know, I mean, I grew up in Africa, so I kind of know and, and it's just yeah. a different way of life, you know. I did exactly the same thing in Ator, Mauritania. Paid a little guy to wash my clothes and he yeah. then hired someone else to wash the clothes. <laughs> I went to the oh, hospital. really? It was a lake water. <laughs> so sharp little yeah, business. Yeah. It was good. But I mean, it's so many memories and just, I wanted to to know uh, Lawrence from from you before before we finish is sure. in terms of good bad and and painful memories of of the Dakar you know what what has been the good the bad and the ugly sort of things wow well you know a couple of times I thought I was out um, I broke the front wheel the second day in Africa uh, and it was my fault entirely and it actually I think contributed to me finishing because I had a special set of wheels and I was using those, you know, Talon hubs, good rims built by, uh, you know, White Brothers or, you know, uh, Buchanan wheels or something. Um, and I used those wheels in the second day in Africa. So first three days in Europe, get to Morocco, cross on the ferry, start the first day. I hit one rock the first day and it start, It was like, oh, geez, that's it's a little bit tweaked now. The second day I'm riding along, I think, wow, I can win this thing. You know, not really, but. You know, you think, I can beat these guys. Why are we going so slow? And I pull out, you know the story, but you pull out in the dust. I hit a big rock like a toaster, and it just, ping, spokes flying everywhere, and I had 500 kilometers to go. Oh. <laughs> and uh, the whole wheel was really, really bad. It was really warped, and I could hear, you know, spokes flailing around. I was so like, oh, this is not good. So I pull over and uh, I was pulled into a little village out of school and I tried to make it better and I actually made it worse. I tried to get it a little straighter with the spoke wrench and I had to ride the bike. It, it was sandy and in, it's actually near Merzuga and places like that. It was sandy down there. So actually on the off-road, it wasn't too bad. I could ride it and make it go, just go slow, make sure it didn't break more spokes. And then I got on the pavement, the liaison was another 100 kilometers into the next bivouac. And I had to ride with one hand on the bar, either the left one or then the right one. I couldn't ride with both. It was shaking so hard. I thought the okay, fillings in my teeth were going to come out. Um, but I got to the end, and then I put the stock wheel on, which I thought was more fragile. It was less strong, and I rode not to break that wheel. And that's how I got one of the reasons why I got to the end. So I learned that valuable lesson without paying the complete, you know, the ultimate price of being out. And then a couple of other times, but that was the, the those ones were like fearful of this whole thing going away. My bike broke again, 17 days in, like the stator went, no stator. And I got a ride out to the, I got three rides out to the next bivouac. So it took more than 22 hours to finish that. So you know what that's like, wow. but I was still in it, still pressed forward <laughs> and still fixed it at like three in the morning at the bivouac. And it was the next day was into Timbuktu and the next day was Dakar. So it was so close to the end. Uh, but anyways, I got to the end of that too. And there was another, well, I, you know, I missed a couple of checkpoints and then there was all sorts of people that missed checkpoints on that particular day. It was a looping stage and the rules were unclear, but they decided to keep us in. So that was a point the three but three times uh, it, i th think this could have been over and it wasn't so it was quite good but anyways it's, all, yeah, it's always plan a plan b and that's why i have two microphones you never know you know <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, i guess the best part is to finish you know that feeling 
of working for more than a year, raising the money, training for nine months to cross the finish line. There's only one feeling that's similar is when our, our daughter was born. The high, the emotional high, that if you could capture and sell that, you would be a billionaire if you could sell that feeling. If you could buy that feeling, you can't buy it. I To get that feeling, and I, I, it's so hard to describe, but it's like watching your child being born. Is it, Caius, you know what that, I don't know if you have kids, Christoph, but that's the only similar feeling I've had where you're in tears. Yeah. And it is such a feeling. And if I could get that back, that's why I keep going, is to have that. And it only lasts a short, it's like a, a couple of hours long. You cross the podium and it's just unbelievable, that feeling. I don't know and how to look, I, I talk about I this. I can't imagine a better way to end this than with what Lawrence <laughs> just said right you there. You know what it's that like, though. Capped it off. Yeah.